morning everyone, welcome to this morning's service, uh, wherever you may be in the world, uh, welcome to our service here at Table View Baptist, and it is so good to, to be together. Uh, we just want to welcome everyone, especially those who do have Table View um, Baptist as their spiritual home, um, we just to assure you that we are praying for you, um, we are here in support of you in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and it's so good for us to, to be together even in this way. We just want to... Um, uh, morning everyone, welcome to this morning's service. Glad that you can be with us. A uh, special welcome to those that um, worship here at Table View Baptist, and this is your spiritual home. Uh, we miss you so much in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and are waiting eagerly for the day when we can all be gathered back together. We hope that you are well. Please be assured of our ongoing prayer um, and service to you here as the leaders of the church. Um, and we're just praying that the Lord is and will continue to use this for his glory um, and that we as the church would rise up to serve him well and honor him well in this time. We are in part three of a series uh, looking at the holiness of God and also looking at the call to be holy um, because God is holy. And looking forward to spending some more time on Isaiah chapter 6 this morning and just seeing how the Lord would mold us and that He would give us a, a glimmer of that vision that Isaiah saw. We're also going to be hearing from Zandi in, in a testimony of how the Lord has worked in her life over these last few weeks worshiping together in song, um, lifting up our desires and our needs, um, and worship to the Lord in prayer, and then sitting under the word together. Before we do that, though, I want to read a passage from Romans chapter 16, a passage that is often read at the end of a service. Um, but this is a passage called the doxology or the blessing. And my hope, my prayer for this, before we would go into time of worship and song, is that all of these things that are praised to the Lord for, the Lord is honored for, would fill our hearts this morning, that the gospel would be heard, our hearts would be transformed, and that he would be glorified for all time. Let's read together Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now, to him who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Christ Jesus, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for, for long ages, but has now been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings has been no, made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together. Into 
darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I've got His three in one. I believe. to take this off opportunity just to thank the Lord uh, for, for healing me and saving me. As you all know, guys, that I've been tested positive with Corona. Um, the, 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 the day I received the results, yes, the fear came. And yeah, as the fear came, yeah, but I was uh, constantly reminded by the verse that is in Deuteronomy. Tindu is going to read it for us. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is one with you. He will not leave you, nor forsake you. Yes, I was reminded that God promised the Israelites that um, he will be with them. Um, he will not leave them, nor forsake them. So that verse kept me going because I was reminded that the God is still with me. I mustn't fear and he will not uh, 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 leave me. As the days goes by, I will, uh, I will have always read that verse and tell myself that I'm going to conquer this. Yes, I'm glad today that... Um, I'm healed, I'm completely healed, and I would like to thank you guys, um, all of you, for your prayer, and it's so comforting to know that uh, even if you're facing those uh, that sickness in, on the bed, you know that there are people out there that are praying for you. There are people that, they, that are thinking for you. So it keeps us going, guys. To be honest, we, we, we cannot thank the Lord uh, 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 a lot yeah yeah we just wanted to also say thank you for the meals i mean we didn't cook the whole of the two weeks because of your meals and that really helped us and relieved um the stress and helped us to also rest um a lot more and so we're really grateful for that we just want to say thank you and also as my mom said for your prayers um they really are what got us through this time and um yeah, we can only thank God that we 
did not have the virus as severely as some others may have had it. Um, and yeah, that's, that is really thanks to your prayers. That is really thanks to God. Um, and yeah, continue to stay safe. Um, and yes, we are really grateful for all your support. And I'd like to thank the Lord for keeping myself and my siblings, my two siblings, my brother and sister, and my father safe that we didn't get the virus and still kept us safe. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Keep well Bye. until we meet again. Bye. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Our reading this morning is in the book of Isaiah. We are going to read Isaiah 6 from verse 1 to 7. We are reading in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundation of threshold shook at voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Who is me? For I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Let us pray. Father God, what a joy to come before you today to say thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, that by your grace, you called us. By your grace, you say to us, come to me. By your grace, we can approach you, you, the Holy One. Thank you, Father, for everything you are doing in your, our life, our lives. Thank you for every single thing you are doing in our families, Lord. Thank you for our countries. Thank you for South Africa. Thank you for the president of South Africa, Lord. May your grace and your mercy be upon him. Let that, the decision they are taking for that country, bring peace. May your people who are living in that country have favor because of you. Thank you, Lord, for the peace in the world. You knew before us, before the time that in this moment, we're going to face 
this pandemic, COVID-19. But Lord, you are the only one who's going to end it. And we trust in you. And we know that as you are the one can make everything possible, we know that tomorrow will be joy. We know that in the future, we will be again together with families, with friends, and we'll worship you as you, you want us to worship you, Lord. Thank you so much. We don't, word, we don't have word to tell you how much we are grateful, Lord. But you know our heart. You know our thought. Lord, let your name be glorified in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. As we mentioned at the beginning of the service, today we continue looking at the holiness of God. And we are in week three of the series in holiness and the call to be holy as God is holy. And this is rooted in 1, cha in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 to 16. It says this, 1 Peter 1, verse 13 to 16. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy... You also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. What we see there is that the standard for holiness is God. And last week, we looked at Isaiah chapter 6. And Micheline has already read that for us today. But what we saw last week in Isaiah chapter 6 was Two important things that I, that I want us to just to remind us about today. Number one was that God is holy. And I, I know I may have said last week this is an attribute of the Lord, but let me correct my own use of, of word there. The holiness of God isn't an attribute of the Lord like love is one of his attributes or justice is one of his attributes. No, the holiness of the Lord is his core character and it is what makes his love perfect it is what makes his holiness i mean his justice perfect it is what makes his judgment perfect it is what makes his mercy perfect but added to that i would want us to see that god is holy in all that he is and all that he does. He is perfect. He is above us and beyond us. This is why it is used, the, the word holy is used in the superlative, meaning it was mentioned three times there. It doesn't just say he is holy, but it was he is holy, holy, holy. This was a way of saying he is above and beyond our understanding. Now, why is this important? Why do I want to start us there? Why do I want to remind us of this core character within God? It's because I think, and I'm convinced and convicted, that the problem that so many of us have today is not that our sin is too big or our problems are too large for the Lord. But I think and I'm convicted and convinced that the problem that we have is that we think that we are more righteous than we actually are. We think more of ourselves than we ought to. And that we have too low a view of God than he actually is. We think too much of ourselves and too little of the holiness of God. 
And my prayer last week, and my prayer still for us is this, is that we would see God in His holiness. We would catch a glimpse of that vision, and that our lives would be transformed. For as we will see today, when you see God for who He is, everything changes. And so let's look, Isaiah chapter 6, let's look at Isaiah's response now to seeing God's holiness. Let's read Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What a response to Isaiah seeing the Lord in all of his glory. What a response. Now, the question that I would put before us today, just to, to start our minds thinking on this, is, is this the right response for Isaiah? Is this the right response for any man who would find themselves before the Lord in his glory, in all of his holiness? Or is this not just, well, a little bit too much? Is this not a little bit too theatrical that Isaiah would be saying, Woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips and I find myself in, a, in the midst of, an, of, of a people of unclean lips. Surely this is a little bit over the top, some might say. And I would argue, absolutely not. If anything, this is underdoing the reaction. You see, Isaiah was the most righteous man in the time right there. This was not a man who was just blatant about sin. Isaiah was a righteous prophet who took sin seriously, he took purity seriously, he took righteousness seriously, he took the law seriously. And even as one of, if not the most righteous man in the day, responds like this, how should your and my response be to the Holy God? You see, in order for us to understand what the right response to the holiness of God is, we need to step back and look at the full picture of Scripture, starting right in the beginning. In the beginning, there was nothing. And God, in His holiness, in His perfect power, in His perfect sovereignty, just speaks the words, and from nothing comes everything. And the creation, the whole universe is brought to be just through his word. And what does he say in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 after each day of the creation? It is good. But then on the sixth day of the creation, he would make man, man in his own image. And how would he describe man? He would describe man as very good. And man and woman worked and lived in the garden in perfect union with the Holy God. Perfect union, perfect relationship. They were. But then comes Genesis chapter 3. We see in Genesis chapter 3 the fall of man. The serpent would tempt Eve and, and, and the husband Adam was standing by passively as he watches his wife fall into sin, and he himself is brought and taken into sin willingly. And man is separated from the perfect God at that moment because of man's rebellion against his holiness. In his heart, he says, I know better than God. In his heart, he says, I want to be God. And that perfect relationship is severed through sin. And God, who refuses to be in the presence of sin, casts humanity away from perfection. Casts them away from his presence. But he, in the curse that is given in Genesis chapter 3, we see a glimmer of hope. And it's seen in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is called the Proto-Evangelion. And, that, and it reads this. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, speaking to the snake. But, but here there's this part in the second half of verse 15. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. 
Right there, that is, as I mentioned, what is called the Proto-Evangelion. This is the first mention of the gospel. This is the glimmer of hope of a prophecy laid down by God about what is to come. There is coming a day where there will be an offspring of man who will be bruised on the hill by the enemy. But he will crush the enemy's head. Now, you just have to ask yourself the question, what injury is worse? An injury to the heel or an injury to the head? Absolutely an injury to the head. And this is a reference to the perfect man will come. And he will be wounded by you, but ultimately he will destroy you. And that perfect man is not you or me. That perfect man is Jesus Christ. And that time was the cross of Jesus Christ. And the time to come will be his return. When he brings all things together and sin is finally judged and the enemy is crushed and thrown into the eternal fire. That is the is and what is to come. And so this is a glimmer of hope that we see in Genesis 3 about what is to come. And then if you read, continue reading through the Old Testament, you will continue to see this theme of God's holiness and the separation of man because of his sinfulness. You would have the man trying desperately to, to come back to the Lord, but as you would page through the, the the pages of the Old Testament, Israel, the people of God, don't go more than one or two pages without falling back into sin. And then who would bring them back? God would bring them back. And then they would fall back into sin. We go through the judges. We go through the kings. And ultimately, what we see is that nothing can bring man back to that right relationship with God, except for God himself. This is illustrated perfectly through the law. The law shows us these two important things. It shows us that God is God's perfect standard for righteousness, and it also shows us through our failure to meet that perfect standard that we are unable to save ourselves. And so Isaiah finds himself before the Lord. And he is struck with how perfect God is and how unworthy he is to be in God's presence. As I mentioned earlier on, he was a righteous man, as righteous as they come. And what does he cry out though? He cries out, woe is me, I am lost, I am no one. I am undone in the presence of God. Now, this is a common theme. This is a common response that we see to the holiness of God in the scriptures. We see Habakkuk in Habakkuk chapter 3 tremble before the Lord and cover his mouth. We would see Job in Job 42 as he has been questioning the Lord. The Lord would come and in Job 38 would say, come, put on your big boy pants, we've got to talk. And then for all those chapters, God would just lay out and question Job. Job, where were you when this happened? Where were you when this happened? Do you have the power to make this happen? And Job's response to seeing the holiness, to seeing the, the true nature of who God is, his response in Job 42 is this, I will speak no more. And he repents and he covers his mouth. Peter, in Luke chapter 5, verse 8, just after he has been called through the, the, the catch, that, that great catch that happened, the miraculous catch of fish. What is Peter's response? Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And up until this point, you may argue, you may say, well, that was before the cross. All of those events occurred that side of the cross. We are now this side of the cross. Through the gospel, we can stand in confidence before the holiness of God. I would say not so fast. Go to Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 17, you see John. John, the one whom Jesus loved, had an intimate relationship with our Lord and Savior. 
the core disciples. He knew the gospel better than you and I would ever know the gospel. He preached the gospel better than you and I could ever preach the gospel. And he finds himself before the Lord in the presence of God in Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 1 verse 17, what does it say? He falls down before Jesus as if he is dead. The correct and the right response before God's holiness is not a cavalier confidence of, oh, how you doing, buddy God? But it is to cover our mouths, to cover our heads, to cower in the corner as Isaiah did to say, I'm not worthy to be here. And so let's look again at Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. He has said these words, Woe is me, for I am lost. Why does he say that? Because when you would see how perfect God is, all of a sudden what happens is you start to see how sinful you are. He says these words, Woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. Why does he respond in this way? Why? Because when you see God for who he is, you also see yourself for who you are. The holiness of God peels away all the masks that we would hide behind. R.C. Sproul, in his, in his video series on the holiness of God, says this, that we are masters of self-justification. We are masters at justifying why we are right in our sin and why we, why we should be able to sin. But he also says this, that God nowhere in Scripture gives us permission even for one sin. He doesn't give us just a chance, okay, well, you can just have one sin. And even if you did, how long ago would you have used your sin up? God's standard is perfection. And you and I, in the core of our beings, know this. It is written into us because the one who made us, the one who wrote us together, wrote our DNA, is the one who breathed all creation into being. And so you and I know that we fall short of the standard of God. So what do we do? We try and cover up our sin. We try and cover up our shame in the exact same way that Adam and Eve in the garden, they covered their shame with those leaves. You and I cover our shame with different things. And one of the primary ways in which we cover our shame is we lie to ourselves about how great our sin is actually, or actually is. We would lie to ourselves and say that we are justified in doing what we are doing. We would lie to ourselves and say that our sin isn't actually that bad. But when you would see God in all of his holiness, all of that is stripped away would melt like, mac, like, like wax in the sun, run away, and we are left with who we really are before who God really is. And Isaiah at that moment realizes this. The second way in which you and I cover up our sin is that we fool ourselves into thinking that God is going to judge us on some curved scale and that only the top half, only the top thirds of good people would be able to be saved. And so as long as we would be better than someone else, well then we were okay. And so we go through our whole lives comparing ourselves to someone else in this world. We would say, well, at least I don't do what Sally does. Apologies if Sally is watching. I don't do what she does, and so I'm better than her. And we puff up our chests, and we fill up ourselves with, a, well, we fill our hearts with, a, with, a, with a self-righteousness that is unable to hold us and unable to keep us in place before the holiness of God. 
but at least it covers the shame momentarily, doesn't it? But it doesn't last into eternity, does it? You see, there's one truth that I think we forget too often. Is that every single one of us are going to stand before the holiness of God at some point in existence. You are going to see God as holy. You can either choose to see God as holy now and turn to Him as your Savior, as your sin is revealed before Him. Or you can keep covering up your sin. You can keep justifying why you are a good person. And then stand before the holy, just God on that glorious day of His return and judgment. But grace will not be an option then. And you will stand before your Creator and Judge. And so my prayer for you today is this. See God as holy today. See Him as perfect today. And pray that the Lord would open our hearts, open our eyes to see how perfect He is and to see the massive debt of sin that we owe and just how rotten sin is. And that we too would fall down like Isaiah does and not overreact, but that we would cry out, rightly so, woe is me. That we would have the same response as Jesus speaks about in the parable, where the unrighteous man doesn't even look up to heaven, but he just beats his chest and goes, I'm not worthy to be before God. We would have that attitude because that man went home justified before God instead of the Pharisee who stood there and said, Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like these other sinners. May we see sin for what it is and let it break us before the holiness of God. But we carry on and we see in verse 5, as he's already said, woe is me, for I am lost. But he then says this, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King of glory, the Lord of hosts. What a response from Isaiah to immediately focus on his lips and the people of, an unclean, of a nation with unclean lips. What has happened here? I believe that Isaiah has, as we've just spoken about, come to realize and come to see the holiness of God and see the weight, the true weight of his sin. And he has been convicted of this. He now stands condemned before this perfect God. The reason why I think you and I can go through seasons in our lives where we would not have the same response is because it's not so much that we become blasé about sin, but it is because we become blasé about the holiness of God. When you would take your eyes off the holiness of God, His perfect splendor, His majestic nature, how He stands in perfection over all things and the standard that he calls us to as his, as, his, as his people, that is when we become blasé about sin. And so, my friends, this morning I would call you as your pastor. The problem is not necessarily the sin in your life. Yes, that needs to be dealt with. But you will keep returning to the sin until you would stand before the holiness of God and catch a better vision you would keep being drawn back to that which was, does, does not satisfy until you are satisfied in Him. And so He covers His mouth in this response. Why does He cover His mouth? Why does He have this reaction? 
I believe the answer for this is found through the teachings of Jesus. Luke chapter 6 verse 45 says this, For his mouth speaks from that which is fills the heart. You see, from the heart comes all of our words. And so the mouth is a doorway, a little bit of, a, of an entrance for us to see, a window should I rather say, to see what is in our hearts. And so Isaiah at that moment knows that his heart is unclean because he's listened to the words that have come out of his mouth. So he covers his mouth. How could I have said the things that I've said? He says, I come from this people who are exactly the same. I love that Isaiah recognizes his own sin, but that he also recognizes the people around him. You see, when you and I would come and stand before God. It isn't just for you and I, but the Lord would save us and then call us to a mission for the people that the Lord has placed us in. But we'll get there in a moment, so let's throw that up into the air. So what is to happen with the sin that Isaiah is so convicted of and stands condemned before the Holy God? What is to happen? I want us to notice before we would answer that question, how does God respond to Isaiah's response? Does God at this point turn around to Isaiah and say, whoa, 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 Isaiah, you, you overreacting here. The sin isn't such a big issue. It's fine. No. How do you respond to the conviction of sin? is you would rely on the Lord washing your sin away. Isaiah doesn't retaliate by saying, God, but I've done X, Y, and Z. Isaiah doesn't turn to his own works. He had some. So the man was a prophet. This man was a righteous man. No, he doesn't turn to that. He doesn't turn to his own words and his own sermons that he would have preached. No, he's just covered his mouth and he says, my mouth has condemned me before the holiness of God. My mouth is showing what the true state of my heart is. No. He's just crying out for mercy before God. And God is faithful in his perfect holiness to meet out perfect mercy. And the angel would fly over because the Lord has willed that angel to go and picks up the searing hot coal, picks it up with the tongs, and he would fly over to Isaiah and he touches Isaiah's lips with this coal. And you can almost hear the sizzle of heat and flesh meeting. And the sting of coal to flesh. But why is this important? Because if this had to happen to us, it would result in tremendous pain. Now why do I highlight that? It's because in the very first week that we spoke about holiness, one of the problems to our pursuit of holiness is that I said sin is fun and we are too lazy slash too scared to deal with our sin. In our pursuit of holiness, we have to be willing to be purified. And the killing of sin can and is often a painful process for us to go through. Purification and the killing of sin is hard for us. It feels like something is dying because something is dying. We are putting to death our sinful nature. We are putting to death the sins of our habits and the sins of our flesh. But Isaiah doesn't protest this painful moment. Instead, he would rejoice in it. My friend, rejoice in the killing of your sin. Pursue the purification of the Lord 
in the midst of your sin. The holiness of God should and does result in our pursuit of holiness. And our pursuit of holiness always results in the killing of sin. It's hard, but don't run away from it. So the coal has touched his lips. He has been purified. Before we move on from this, I would just want to ask us this question. Where has the coal come from? Where was the coal taken from? The coal was taken from the altar. Now, why is that significant? See, throughout the Old Testament, the holiness of God was symbolized through the sacrificial system. That in order to come before this holy God, something had to die. In order for your shame to be covered, something had to die. We see this right from Genesis chapter 3 in the garden. Straight away, as man has tried to cover himself with leaves woven together to try and cover his shame, what does God do? No, God would go kill an animal, take its fur and wrap humanity in that to cover his shame. You see, straight from the beginning, God was meeting the needs to cover shame. It was never fulfilled through the sacrificial system. And animals constantly died on the altar to cover shame and to create a, a, a space just for a temporary period where man could come before this holy God. But as Hebrews said, the blood of oxen, the blood of bulls and goats, and all of these sacrificed animals would never be able to wash away the sin of man, would never be able to atone for the sin of man. It would take a perfect sacrifice. And so on the sacrificial table, on the altar, Many things died. And from this altar in Isaiah chapter 6, the coal is taken and it touches his lips and he is purified at that point. You see, right there, this is a shadow of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus would be and Jesus is the perfect lamb, the one who died to take away the sins of the world. And Isaiah tastes purity. He is sin is atoned for and his guilt is washed away. Listen to these words that we see here in, in, in Isaiah 6 verse, verse 7. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips and your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. What beautiful words to say. As the Lord said those words into your heart before. Have we ever turned to the Lord in the midst of our sin, having been convicted of our sin, standing condemned before the Holy God, humbled ourselves and cried out for his mercy. And as he washed you in the blood of Jesus Christ, purifying your sins. You see, Jesus is the fulfillment of, a, of Genesis 3 verse 15. The, sim, the, the offspring of man, born of man to the Virgin Mary. Perfect man, perfect God, lived the perfect life to die for sin that was not his, to be the sacrifice for sin that was not his, to atone, to pay for sin that was not his, but ours. The Holy God became sin because the Holy God loves us perfectly in his perfect grace. The gospel is given to us. And so I'll ask that question again. Have you heard these words whispered into your soul? 
Your guilt is taken care of. Your sin has been paid. Not by your righteousness. Not because you're a good person. But because Jesus has loved us. That he died for our sins. This is how the holiness of God moves from being an ethereal thought, from moves from being an ethereal concept to the gospel. The perfect God would come, overcome sin that has separated us from his perfection, from his holiness, and die for our sins. But it doesn't stop there, does it? He carries on. And he says this in verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And whom will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. What does the holiness of God result in, in our lives? Number one, it results in us seeing God for who he is. And standing in awe of who he is and realizing that he is not like us. He is other. His ways are above us. His thoughts are above us. He stands as different, as perfect compared to us. But when we see him as he is, we also see ourselves for who we are. We see our sin. We see all the walls that have been put up to cover our shame and they melt away. And we see the need for a savior. And so we turn to him in his perfection And he grants us his grace through his perfect holy love. And he washes away our guilt. He washes away and he pays for our sin. He atones for our sin. And then he calls us to the mission of the gospel. And calls us to grow in holiness. Isaiah saw the holiness of God was transformed and then sent out on mission. Now, you and I aren't Isaiah. We know that. We may not have the same call as Isaiah did to go and preach to the nations, but you and I are called to God's people, to be God's people, and we are called to holiness. Don't believe me? We read the verse earlier on. 1 Peter 1 verse 15. Let's go back and read it again. I hope that you didn't miss this. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Our salvation has resulted in us being positionally holy before God. Atone of our sin. But now we are called to grow in that holiness. We are called to the mission of God to proclaim the gospel of Jesus to this broken, dying world. That we would also realize that we are people of unclean lips. We are a man and woman of unclean lips and among a people of unclean lips. And our heart would break for the people that the Lord has placed us in. From next week, we're going to be anchored in 1 Peter 1. And we're going to look, how do we grow in holiness? Following from that, we are going to see that the scriptures form the basis for truth. That we can find our worldview, that we can have our minds transformed through the scriptures. As we would see the holy God through the scriptures. And then we are going to finish off in three weeks time. Just looking at our world and asking this question, what does it mean to think holy thoughts? What does it mean to view the world through the lenses of God's holiness? Put another way, how can we have a biblical worldview? How should we be thinking of so many of the things that are going on in the world? We are called to be holy. And in order to be holy, we have to think holy thoughts. That's where I'm going to leave us today. My prayer for you, though, today, is that you would be challenged. That your heart would see the holiness of God. And if you haven't been in, 
in awe, flattened in a while before the holiness of God, blown away to cause us to tremble before his perfection. May we pursue that, not just for the kick of it, but so that our sin would lose its power and then our worship would be amplified because we may have a glimmer, a glimpse of that vision again of the holiness of God, that our worship would be in response to his perfect love, his perfect gospel, and how much he loves us and how holy he is. Let's pray together. Father God, forgive us for the times that we've watered down your holiness. When we have thought more highly of ourselves than we ought, more highly of our own righteousness than we ought, too little of your glory and your goodness. Father God, we thank you for your word. And through your word, we see the holiness of God. And through your word, we see the perfection of who you are. And I pray, Lord God, that you would place within us a desire for your word. A desire to learn to grow in holiness as we would surrender ourselves under your perfect word that reveals your perfect character that shows us the holiness of God. We thank you for the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ that has taken away our sin, washed us clean of our sin, paid the debt for our sin and taken away our guilt. We thank you, Lord, that you made that possible, that you brought that all to be right from the beginning of time. Your holiness directs everything. May we sit under it. May we grow in understanding of your holiness and we, may we grow in reflection of your holiness to this world. We ask this, Lord, in your name. Amen.